last summer, I spent 15 days living in the ocean. My five fellow aquanauts and I were in a habitat called Aquarius, bolted to the sea floor 20 meters deep off the coast of the Florida Keys. Unlike a submarine, the habitat was pressurized to match the surrounding water pressure, and that meant that we could spend all day diving. Just to show you how surreal it was, here's a video of me brushing my teeth while a school of yellowtail snapper were outside the viewport. And here, mission leader Fabian Cousteau and I are just working over a cup of tea at the kitchen table in Aquarius. Eagle rays, some of the most majestic creatures I've ever seen, would glide past the viewport in our bunk room almost every day. Living underwater was surprisingly comfortable, especially if you don't mind freeze-dried food and close quarters. The habitat was just a little bit bigger than a yellow school bus. And sleeping was not an issue because diving up to eight hours a day is thrilling but exhausting. Our days were crammed with research and outreach. Fabian brought down a deck of cards to fill downtime, but we never even had time to open them. We were researching the tiny creatures in the ocean that form the first link in the ocean's food chain. We looked at how the reef is responding to climate change. We measured contaminants, including some from the oil spill. And we took the first ultra slow motion video footage of marine creatures in the wild. Here's a slow motion video of a mantis shrimp just barely missing catching its prey. The mantis shrimp has the most elaborate visual system discovered in all of the animal kingdom. And just this past October, researchers in Queensland found that the shrimp's vision is so precise that it can look at the difference between cancer cells and healthy cells. Surfacing was bittersweet. I would go back in a heartbeat, as odd as that might sound. Before we could go back to the surface, we had to decompress for 18 hours. I know, it looks weird. Um, Skyping with students, I was often asked if I was scared of getting eaten by a shark. <laughs> and the answer is no. Um, sharks really won't attack humans. So I said, unless the shark mistook me for a turtle, I would be plenty OK. And then a six-year-old came right back out and said, I better not wear my Ninja Turtle costume underwater. <laughs> I did have an encounter with a shark, but it was very neighborly. I was working so intently filming something on the seafloor that I lost track of time and didn't realize day had turned to night. And when I looked around, a reef shark had just brushed past my leg. I wasn't scared, but I was a little bit spooked that night. For 15 days, I was an alien on my own planet. And my biggest takeaway was how much more we have to learn about the ocean, what a complete mystery it still is, and how much more it has to teach us. My greatest fear is that ecosystems in the ocean will disappear before we even knew they existed. And unfortunately, with the triple threat of overfishing, climate change, and pollution, we're getting close to that as a reality. There's the saying that, we know more about the dark side of the moon than we do the depths of the ocean. And that's surprising, but it's true. I've heard people try to reconcile this by saying space has simply appealed more to the human imagination. But as someone who has glimpsed the wonders of the deep and been completely enamored, I knew it must be more than that. Space and ocean exploration were on the same track for millennia. Both started with early civilizations when stargazers would scan the skies and free divers and sailors scoured the seas. Then in the Renaissance, the stargazers built telescopes to probe even deeper in space, and divers used new technologies like the diving bell and diving dress to go deeper into the ocean. Then in the early 20th century, rockets dramatically increased our knowledge of space, while new diving technologies like scuba gear and decompression diving um, it added to our knowledge of the oceans. And then Sputnik changed everything. It made control of space a strategic military imperative. 
The race to space between the US and Russia took on a fantastical dimension. The US, and I'm quoting the New York Times, 1957, was in a race for survival. The US then realized if it had any hope of competing with the Russians, it had to up its game with space research. And that's when it created NASA, the first government-run independent research group that would lead American Americans into space. And from there, the rest is history. We landed men on the moon, we put rovers on Mars and on one of Saturn's moons. Um, and we keep using technologies to probe even deeper into space. President Kennedy wanted to create a NASA for the oceans. He pushed for that in a speech he gave on October 22nd, 1963, exactly a month before he was assassinated. And again, the rest is history. We don't have a NASA for the oceans, and ocean exploration was left behind. What's more is that now, 20 years after the end of the war, more than 20 years, um, funding for space exploration continues to dwarf that for ocean exploration. Just last year, NASA's exploration budget was 150 times greater than the equivalent ocean research budget. To put that in perspective, last spring we lost Nereus, the world's flagship ocean research vehicle. Um, Nereus in, imploded when it was in the South Pacific. It cost $8 million to build. That's a fifth the cost of one Apache helicopter, of which we have thousands. And yet Nereus was the only one of its kind. We need to explore the oceans, not just for the sake of exploration anymore, but because it might be getting too late and the situation is really bad. Here, a whale has washed up on the shores of the Puget Sound, dead because its stomach was filled with plastic. And unfortunately, these events are not uncommon, and they're only harbingers of what's to come. So with that situation and the history in mind, let's look forward at what the future of ocean exploration is going to be. It's not going to get the Sputnik-fueled um, government boost like space did. Instead, it'll be funded jointly by public and private sectors. And the good news is that groups are stepping up and in exciting ways. James Cameron visited the Marianas Trench. This chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt, has his own Ocean Research Institute now. The Pew Charitable Trust is pitching in, and even Leonardo DiCaprio is raising funds for the cause. Government organizations are helping, but progress is slow because there's really no government infrastructure. Imagine SpaceX trying to launch without the space station or the infrastructure that NASA built with its billions. And then ocean exploration is and always will be international. Space exploration was funded by nationalism, but ocean research will be a joint effort. It might depend on something like an oceanographic version of CERN, where I worked five, four years ago. CERN showed that a multinational large research organization funded jointly by the government and industry sectors can be successful for things like finding the Higgs boson and inventing the World Wide Web. So hopefully there'll be an ocean version of those things. Now, let's hope the clarion call is heard, that there will be more focus, more funding, and more collaboration, so that this new era will be one for ocean exploration that's desperately overdue. Thank you. <laughs>